thank you for inviting me to the COMSOL conference. I was uh, surprised to be invited to do this because originally my coworkers were uh, supposed to present the paper at the Midwest meeting, but they were unable to, meet, to make it, and so uh, this morphed into the uh, national presentation that we have today. But I wanna give a special thanks to Nathan May, who did much of the COMSOL modeling for this, and Ryan Paul as well. Uh, the title of my talk today is A World of Multi-Physics Applications in Carbon and Graphite. The uh, GraphTech may not be well known to people, but we were associated with the Union Carbide Corporation for much of the 20th century, and we were one of the founding components of the Union Carbide and Carbon Products uh, group. So we have a lot of uh, material science expertise in that field. Uh, today, GraphTech is a $1 billion company with 2,400 employees worldwide. We were founded in 1886 as the National Carbon Company in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. We were purchased uh, roughly two months ago by Brookfield Asset Management, but we're still called GraphTech. We have a brand new innovation and technology center in Cleveland, Ohio, and there's a lot of new material uh, being developed for the 21st century. There are two primary business segments in the company. The industrial materials segment, which uh, services the steel and the ferro alloy markets, they make primarily graphite electrodes, uh, refractory materials, and needle coke. And we sell about uh, $840 million uh, worth of that in 2014. The, a smaller segment is engineered solutions, where I work. Uh, the, we service the energy storage, electronics, solar, and other markets. Uh, Lithium-ion batteries are one of the big interests at the current time. We uh, focus on both synthetic and natural graphite products. And we had about $245 million worth of revenue in uh, 2014. In the engineering, engineering solutions group, there are four divisions. Uh, advanced electronic technologies, which make the flexible graphite heat spreaders used in mobile electronics. Advanced graphite materials, which includes high temperature furnaces uh, in which we make uh, sapphire or other or silicon, silicon carbide, and industrial diamond drill bit molds, etc. The advanced composite materials, which is mostly carbon composites and car woven carbon fibers. And the advanced materials group, which focuses on powders, which are used in uh, lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, uh, consumer electronics, et cetera. All of these groups are COMSOL enabled. We have a central innovation center that does a lot of the modeling for our facilities as needed. Uh, a little background on carbon material science. Carbon has several allotropes that are familiar. Everybody knows diamond. It's a uh, a CVD material process, or it's a sparkly piece of jewelry on a ring, or it's a part of a drill bit because of its hardness and three-dimensional sp3 structure. Uh, amorphous carbon is soot, and the topic that we're most interested in graphite is graphite or graphene. Graphene is the single molecular layer, sometimes two or three layers, but uh, most of the graphite is hundreds if not millions of layers thick. And two forms uh, related to that are carbon nanotubes, which are a tube-shaped structure, and fullerenes, which are spherical in nature. Today I'm going to present three examples of how we use multi-physics at GraphTech. Uh, the first one is an induction furnace in which we optimize the, thermos, the thickness of furnace insulation. The second is a crystal growth furnace in which we determine the power profile needed to grow highest quality crystals. And finally, my own interest of electronics thermal management is in selecting the optimal grade of an orthotropic or anisotropic graphite heat spreader. For the um, optimization of an induction furnace insulation, first of all, an induction furnace has to go up to 3,000, maybe 3,100 degrees Celsius. Most materials vaporize, melt, or simply disappear at that temperature. So most of the materials are graphite, including the structure of the furnace itself. In this case, you can see it has a steel shell with graphite lids, graphite base plates, and then a payload, which is graphite, or will be graphitized. 
On the outside of this is a water-cooled induction coil. These are copper tubes that are hollow. Water flows through them. So we know the temperature limit there is going to be 100 degrees C, hopefully less than that. And we need insulation between the graphite susceptor, which can be thousands of degrees, and these uh, low temperature materials. Uh, it costs quite a bit to run these, so uh, optimizing that layer is valuable. Uh, here's an animation where we showed how we stepped through uh, the COMSOL model with different thicknesses. Uh, it's a chart of the, the current required to run the furnace and the insulation thickness, and you can see that uh, we had a, oh, how's this working? With the uh, lower insulation thickness, we had, uh, the coils were too hot and would melt or the water in them might turn to steam. And beyond a certain thickness, the coils were sufficiently cool. So the optimal thickness was about 10 centimeters, about 0.1 meters in this. It's a fairly straightforward example of, uh, of using this, but it is an induction furnace, so it's uh, not resistive heating. Like a lot of furnaces, we use induction for this particular uh, process. Uh, another example of how we used COMSOL was in a PID control model of uh, crystal growth. And this may look familiar to some people. It's similar to the silicon bool. I think this might be sapphire, they won't tell me. But uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool bell jar enclosure with numerous structures. I think these are graphite as well. Uh, you can see the familiar induction coil uh, around the edges. And uh, the idea here is to pull the crystal bool from the melt. So you have a two-phase system uh, in, inside of a, an iridium crucible containing the, the melt components and oxides. The, the speed of the pull of the bool is what we were trying to optimize here and how much power would be required to keep the melt at temperature based on the reduced amount of mass in it. So we ran a number of uh, PID models here. You can see the, the blue line is the crystal height, the green is the power level, uh, and the, the red is the profile that we wanted. No need to go into details, but uh, we did find an optimal solution here with the, the PID tuning and we're able to implement this into the control scheme in the factory to, uh, to optimize it. Finally, uh, I can talk more about my own area of expertise, which is uh, electronics cooling. The smartphones, tablets, and flat panel displays are among the biggest users of flexible graphite. The, uh, a commercial sheet, just for example, I have an example with me. This is a sheet of graphite. It's 40 microns thick, and that's about 100,000 layers of graphene. So if you read about how amazing graphene is, just remember this is 100,000 layers of it. We can make you a good deal. But this is a commercial product. So in this phone, which is a, a Samsung phone, I think it's a Galaxy S5, we have a multiple heat sources inside of it, a power converter, an LED, uh, a radio, of course, and a processor. So where's the graphite? You might spot the first one is a small square patch or a, a small gra grayish patch in the second image. There's another one under the black PET layer on the outer skin. And there's a third one under the graphite foil or the copper foil on the behind the faceplate. And you'll find this in just about every teardown. This image was taken from ifixit.com, which is a common teardown website. Anybody can uh, go there and find out what the components are. Quick aside, what is not graphite? Uh, we've, we've seen people uh, trying to use carbon composites to remove heat. The, the graphite spreads heat quite well, but carbon does not because it's less structured. The molecules are not as organized as they are in graphite. And so these very beautiful looking uh, laptops or other things, they don't conduct heat terribly well. And when you do a cross section of the materials, you can see uh, these will be glass fiber filled or they'll be pan uh, polyacrylonitrile uh, carbon filled with fairly low thermal conductivity, although they are very strong and that's why they're used in tennis rackets and uh, golf clubs. 
and uh, skis, other sports uh, materials. But they're they are not graphite fiber, they're carbon fiber. So why choose graphite heat spreaders? Why are they used? Well, first of all, they're thin, as you saw from my example. They're dozens of microns thick. They're very efficient. They, they have a high thermal conductivity. Uh, the example I showed you was 1,500, uh, maybe more than 1,500 watts per meter Kelvin, which is about four times that of copper. They're very lightweight, about the same as paper. And why not choose them? Well, the engineering's not easy. These are highly orthotropic. They're anisotropic. They're, uh, the, the heat conduction in plane is very high, but through plane is very low. They are not a direct drop-in for isotropic materials. And if you're trying to model this, uh, I know a lot of us as modelers would make a thin rectangle or sheet and say, this is one material property, let's compare the other material property. And you, you can't quite do that because, uh, as I'll show, the, the meshing gets in the way with this high orthotropic ratio. And, of course, an unvalid simulation may mislead and uh, cause you to draw the wrong conclusion about it. But they do work very well. So the challenges for the end user are to select the optimal grade, the thickness and the thermal conductivity, the size and shape of a microns thick heat spreader in a cell phone or tablet computer. Uh, compare the isotropic material with highly orthotropic materials. It, it, we're often competing with uh, copper in this application. Some of the legacy software tools include CFD, which are finite volume based codes for internal air cooling with fans. Remember 10, 20 years ago, all the computers had fans in them and they were boxes and they were rectilinear. So a lot of people are still using these software packages which were optimized for that, when in fact, uh, most of the electronics are just thin with no air in them. And temperatures within smartphone com components are dominated by uh, conduction rather than convection. Through the conv convoluted laminates, their structures, their phase change, uh, the orthotropic materials, and gaps between the layers. Just to give you an example of the properties, the uh, a uh, NG here is natural graphite, SG is synthetic graphite. Uh, the thickness on these, the natural could be a quarter millimeter thick. Synthetic tends to be much thinner, about 17 to 40 microns. Conductivity, thermal conductivity in the plane is 400 in the case of natural graphite, sometimes higher. Uh, 1500, give or take a little in, in the plane. These are very high values. Through plane, however, they're only about three and a half. And the result of this is if you look at the ratio of in-plane to through-plane, you see ratios that are 100 in the case of natural graphite and over 440 in the case of synthetic graphite. So these are not just orthotropic. These are highly orthotropic ratios. This is to the point where you start distorting, distorting the mesh and getting incorrect results. So here's a, a quick example we put together in Comsol just to uh, prove a point here. It's a simplified geometry, a square swatch of graphite about, uh, about 50, uh, 500 millimeters. Uh, a little heat source in the middle, we chose an LED, which uh, puts out heat, has a substrate and some copper pads. And we compared an aluminum and a, uh, a Graftec spreader shield graphite, the, the natural graphite form. So here's an example using um, a, a, one of the traditional tools and I had an auto mesh set, and it put one grid layer through that uh, quarter millimeter. I mean, how much mesh can a quarter millimeter require anyway, right? I, I fixed the length per cell at 0.43 millimeters, the height was the full height quarter millimeter, and the length to height ratio was 1.7. That's not really a distorted mesh, that's fine, right? But when you consider the conductivity ratio of 108, and then you divide the conductivity by the aspect, ratio, you get 62.7, which is starting to distort that mesh. So what I did is I manually added mesh layers all the way down to 64 layers. And in order to get that conductivity ratio down, uh, at, at 64 mesh layers inside of a quarter millimeter thick material, I was able to get a ratio of 1.0. Now we don't have to go that far to avoid distortion, but that was, uh, I wanted to see what the effect was on the result, how, how mesh independent or grid independent was the result. 
So again, we ran the model. There was heat being generated in the, in the center. And then I took a strip through the center, a line probe through the center of the heat source along the, uh, along the spreader. And this is a slice through the plane. And the top one is a piece of aluminum. The bottom is a piece of graphite. The aluminum had a four, four mesh layers, which you can see almost nothing is happening outside of the heat source, which is those center two columns of cells. Uh, I could use a single layer of mesh through the plane and it would be just fine. I would get a, a reasonable convergence. In the case of the graphite, however, uh, with, even with 32 layers, you can see how the, uh, it varies substantially through the thickness and through the, the backside. So the heat in this is coming in the top side and I was exposed to a natural convection environment on the backside. So this is uh, the result that I received uh, using a, a CFD model, a, a traditional package. And you can see the aluminum sheet, let's see if I can get my, the aluminum is this top value and the surface temperature here was about 80 degrees and it decreased as the radius increased to five millimeters. Uh, I went out to 250, it's a much bigger model, but you can see the difference here. With the single layer, the overshoot was pretty high. And as I increased the number of mesh layers, the solution converged on uh, a more reasonable value. There was still a difference between the top and bottom temperatures due to the low thermal conductivity. But you can see the convergence uh, was pretty clear. So I had my colleague do this in ComSol because we wanted to see what the effect would be. And this is what he gave me. I was, I was really disappointed because I wanted to see more difference, but you can see that uh, there are three or four lines on this graph, but they're all overlapping. The aluminum value was fairly close to uh, what we had in the, uh, in the original one. And by the way, we used a, an applied heat transfer coefficient on the surface rather than a natural convection environment just to save time. Uh, the backside showed no temperature difference at all, just not measurable. So I, I was very pleased with this. But this is a, a, a quantifying the error that we saw in the CFD model. And we had more than 11%, 14% in the case of a single auto mesh layer. And as I increased it to four mesh layers, I was uh, getting much less error. With the aluminum, however, a, a traditional material, there was very little error in the model regardless of what I did. So the point is that these, some of these models, they're not set up for our highly orthotropic material. This is the console version of that in graphical form. And you can see on the, uh, with a single mesh layer, there was error, but it was only 0 0.35 degrees C, which is hardly measurable. The, the folks in the lab won't even notice that there's a difference, most likely. Uh, with two mesh layers, it got, uh, it reduced. And by four, you're pretty much down to no error uh, with the layer. So the, the console was very efficient in that regard. All right. Uh, Shifting gears a little bit, uh, another use for this material is as a thermal interface material, which is a uh, thermal interface is the joint between two materials. And uh, the, the standard way to measure this is the ASTM D5470 test, in which you take uh, cylinders made of aluminum and uh, they're two inches diameter and you press them together. You have a heat source on the top, the heat flows down through the middle and you calculate what the the surface temperatures of the aluminum would be and what they must be across the sample material and thus calculate the thermal resistance and thermal conductivity. Uh, you can do the thermal conductivity if you know the, how thick that material is. Normally these are greases, phase change materials, occasionally uh, liquid metals such as indium are used, but graphite also works fairly well. Uh, however, one of the problems with modeling that I found is the, thank you, um, the area of the source and the area of the sink in this D5470 test have to be the same. And in many applications, you find that the device that's, that's the source of the heat is actually mounted on a much larger plate. And so the heat will spread in the substrate. But what we've seen a lot, uh, particularly in the case of LEDs, is the spreader, the graphite spreader, is larger than the source. 
And because of this highly orthotropic material property, the heat is spread it, like a sink, and it actually performs better than the D5470 test would measure. But the trick is to capture that in the modeling. So uh, I've come up with a, a way to simplify the graphite model. Here you have a, a source, uh, a PET layer, or, or some kind of plastic carrier or dielectric graphite, and then another, uh, another carrier and an adhesive, for example. And the way to simplify that is make a contact resistance value. You can apply that between two adjacent solids, but don't simplify the graphite. That needs to be meshed. That needs to capture the spreading. So again, graphite foil is highly orthotropic. 3D meshers are geometry-based, not property-based. So uh, most of them, at least as far as I know, uh, Comsol's always surprising me, but uh, this will look like a, a thin sheet, and you'll need to manually go in there and add layers to make sure that it starts to capture that. Comsol has a nice feature. It enables a, a z-axis display expansion to fill the screen without distorting the physics. Uh, this is a very, it's very handy for looking at materials that are only 25 microns thick uh, in, inside of a, a thin device such as a cell phone. Uh, another thing I haven't tried but I think might be useful is a solution adaptive mesh refinement technique can sometimes capture uh, high gradients in, in the models. Um, I'll go through this quickly. Sometimes uh, the, the graphite is bent. We had some trouble originally with orthotropic uh, or, or orthogonal grids getting the heat to go around the corners. So what we ended up doing is coming up with workarounds making isotropic corners, adding adiabatic surfaces. Um, on angled plates, you have to monitor your heat in and heat out so that there are no heat losses due to uh, insufficient mesh. Uh, we've, we've measured this. We know the heat goes through the corners. But here's a, a really nice feature that uh, the console, uh, Bjorn in particular, enabled this for us. And you can see what happens if uh, you have an orthotropic heat flux in a material and it doesn't bend around the corner. So Comsol has, a, has added curvilinear coordinates. I think this was in version 4.3 that this finally became a mainstream ability. But it, uh, it was available before that if you knew how to, uh, to program the software to do it. Uh, finally, just uh, I wanted to show you where I started on this. I wanted to make a spreadsheet calculator. And I derived all the equations and tried to figure out how to do this in, in Excel so that I could distribute it to our applications engineers and customers. So I, I did everything, made it axisymmetric, uh, made it as simple as I could so that a spreadsheet could handle it, and realized that uh, I was fighting against these uh, there's ratios in the equations, the uh, thermal conductivity, the orthotropic numbers, and the ratio of the thickness versus the radius, it, it got very complicated. I was proud of it. That's why I included it in here. But uh, to be honest, uh, Comsol once again has come up with the app builder. And uh, my next goal is to simply build it in an app builder, put it on the web, and then I don't have to work with that anymore. So thank you all for, the, uh, uh, for all that work. Um, so just to recap. Um, so Graftec has been using Comsol to, uh, on many projects. I've only presented three here today. An induction furnace in which we optimize the thickness of the furnace insulation. Uh, a crystal growth furnace in which we uh, determine the power profile of grow crystals. And electronics thermal management where we uh, selected an optimal grade of a graphite heat spreader. Thank you.